Make pain to base. Under attack by commie Nazis. Hello, my name is Michael, and Babylon Berlin is a German-language television series on Netflix that was originally released back in 2017 that is set in the late 1920s world of Weimar Republic, Germany. It is a mystery, film noir, detective story mixed in with all of these incredible political elements in the world of 1920s Berlin. And it is one of the best shows I've ever seen on Netflix, and probably my favorite TV show right now. Babylon Berlin follows the detective Gerion Rath, a police officer from Cologne, Germany. Rath, Gerion. Gerion? Come see the house in middle alter? Aus Köln. Excuse me, Köln, Germany, who was working in the Vice Squad, investigating. Strangely enough, he is sent to Berlin by a powerful political figure in his hometown in the first season in order to track down a series of sexual-related films that were taken by a group of gangsters in order to extort political figures. His father happens to be on one of those tapes, and he's sent there in order to get it back or destroy it. And when he does so, he plunges into a world that he's never before seen of gritty, interpolitical violence, police corruption, and all of the lovely stew that makes up a great film noir. The main character is played by Volker Brook, and he is a fantastic actor. In fact, all of the acting in this series is great. It is top-notch across the board. They are able to bring out uh, an incredible series of emotions and feelings from these people that are very, very complex characters. Unlike in a standard American police drama, the characters in Babylon Berlin are more noirish characters. They are flawed human beings that have good sides and bad sides to them, and they're a mixture of gray, just as everyone is. They're not some sort of righteous figure of goodness that's always meant to be the hero. Next to Gary and Rath is the young woman Charlotte Ritter, played by Liv Lisa Freeze, who's also fantastic in this role, as a young police typist who moonlights as a prostitute who gets involved more and more in the investigations of Gary and, until she's actually brought in as a junior investigator in the Berlin Police Department, which is a very unusual thing for a woman to do in 1929. And the world of Babylon Berlin is incredible. Just like any real film noir, it is a dense, layered, evil city in which we're not necessarily looking at the terrible villains that we see. We're seeing everyone on each side of this do good things and bad things, but it's the corruption of the world that's bad. It's the swamp that they live in that corrupts everyone that's really the main character of this story. And this version of Berlin looks beautiful. Hey, Mr. Fräulein, verbinden Sie mich bitte mit Baden 1603. Danke. I mean, this, you know, it looks like a Hollywood movie with the backgrounds of the horses and the cobblestone streets and all of the costumes and all of the sets and the characters' hairstyles. Everything just looks absolutely beautiful. And crucially, this doesn't just focus on the physical things and the aesthetic appeal of the time, because that actually kind of bores me. I'm not all that interested in the era of the 1920s aesthetically in terms of its music and its clothing styles and everything like that. It spends a heck of a lot of time sinking into the morass of politics in 1920s Germany. The first two seasons start out with a close look at two groups that are trying to destabilize the German Republic. Germany was a monarchy until 1918, when the German Revolution that came at the end of the First World War toppled the Kaiser and replaced it with what we now call the Weimar Republic, which lasted until 1933, when the Nazis took over. And so there are a number of different strands pulling in various directions of this society. The authorities of this time period are the Social Democrats, the people that created, in many ways, the modern democracy of, this, of the Weimar Republic to replace the antiquated 19th century 
imperial monarchy system run by the Kaiser. And in some ways, it's kind of strange that they almost give in to a, an extreme right-wing vision of what the Weimar Republic was, because they show the Republic as being this seedy, ugly, dirty, nasty place filled with libidinous sex and crime. The TV show is actually based on a series of mystery novels started in the mid-2000s, also by a, a writer named Volker for some reason that were sort of based on his love of Philip Marlowe, and you see that quite a bit in this series. Very good idea, and now? and The Sopranos, and mixed in there with the, the film M. And you can see all of these different currents and strands mixing together in these books. Even though the name film noir kind of associates it with France, the French were really the ones to first culturally and critically appreciate the genre. And the Americans were the ones to first commercialize it and and make most of the entries in the genre. But really, the first film noir was probably made in 1931 with the Fritz Lang film M. <laughs> And it was in this movie which starred Peter Lorre as a vicious child-killing serial murderer that really pioneered the idea of showcasing a degenerate, evil, corrupt city, which was probably in turn based on the Weimar Republic's salacious press that tended to create this image of a world gone mad, which wasn't really true, of course, but it fed into the fears of the extreme right in Germany in the 1920s and 30s to make it appear that this place was sort of a, a cesspool of crime and degeneracy. I don't know how many times I've said that in this review, but, but that's that's kind of what we're going through. Aside from the Social Democrats, there are two other political groups during the first two seasons that we get a solid look at. We get to see the monarchists who are interested in crushing the Weimar Republic and bringing back the Kaiser into power who had abdicated and left for Holland back in the late in, in 1918. General Ludendorff, das Ende der Republik bekannt gibt und die Wiedereinführung der Monarchie verkündet. Sobald Berlin gesichert ist, kehrt seine Majestät der Kaiser aus dem Exil zurück und wendet sich in einer Ansprache an sein geliebtes Volk. And their efforts to undermine and crush Weimar society, which they have falsely blamed for the loss in the First World War and all of Germany's subsequent problems after that. And we also get a look at extremists on the left, the communists, who are led by this evil communist woman who they, they, they jokingly call Madame Stalina. I don't remember the name of the character, but she's a doctor. She's actually in the, in the, uh, the German language series Dark as a main character in that. And she does a great job as this, this sort of sour-faced, evil communist fanatic. get to see the uh, the interplay between the extremist right-wing police who viciously assault and militarize themselves by getting rifles and shooting down communists in the streets on May Day. And the terroristic communists that are trying to overthrow the German state and replace it with some sort of Soviet paradise. They 
does a really good job at not really showing either of these two sides to be exactly entirely good or evil. It sort of humanizes everyone there. For instance, it shows the extreme depths of poverty that the character of Charlotte Ritter is living in with her family in these degraded slums and the extreme misery that they have to go through by scraping together money through sex work in order to pay for medical procedures, which they can barely afford, and the just the grittiness and the dirt and the uh, the sliminess of their everyday lives. That they Sin. Do you see now of Tasha? Would Maya come, va? That's what you said? Now come, say it nochmal! Not, uh... Ruhig dich mal! Let's get rid of it and then get rid of it, or what? Oh, hey! But in some ways, the monarchists, you can kind of sympathize with some of them in a way, or at least the main character does, because he's working against them in the first two seasons, but then he also supports the police at one crucial point. Rund um die Demonstration am 1. Mai 1929 vor, darin beschuldigt ihr Kollege die Kommunisten, sie und ihn beschossen zu haben. Können Sie die Angaben Ihres Kollegen bestätigen? Oder wollen Sie heute unter Eid etwas hinzufügen? Wir wurden beschossen. Das ist eine Lüge! Hiermit bestätige ich die Aussage meines Kollegen Bruno Wolter. It makes it seem that the end lies and says that the police were not shooting down communists in the streets. So it kind of moves back and forth between those two. And naturally, it goes without saying that they're going to have to integrate, you guessed it, the Nazis into all of this and make the rise of Nazism a major force in the series, although they do it crucially very, very slowly, which I love. They didn't just toss it out in the first episode. You only very gradually get interested in what the Nazis are doing in the first season, and, very, and only at the very end of the second season did they become a major force. And then by the third season, they were the place as the main sort of central evil going on. But let's talk about the recently released third season of Babylon Berlin. In this one, we pick up with our character Gary on Wrath as he begins to investigate the murders that are going on at a film studio. And I think this kind of beautifully integrates the late 1920s expressionistic German cinema that made such a massive contribution to the history of film with movies like Metropolis and Nosferatu. It sort of laid the foundation for artistic cinema during that time period. And it sort of integrates within it the idea of turning a man into a machine. It's known for us to gain. We schaffen the neuen man. Wir schaffen die Menschmaschine. Ein von Schmerzen und Angst befreiter Android. That we saw in Metropolis, where you have a woman that is transformed into a machine creature in order to attack the masses and lead them against in some sort of revolution against the people in the, the above world that are the bourgeois living there. And these film studio murders are intimately tied in with the character known as the Armenian, a man named Edgar Kasabian, who's brilliantly played by a Croatian-German actor whose name I don't want to try to pronounce because I butcher it. But uh, he's just, he's fantastic in this role as this creepy, dark gangster. It's not all about politics. It weaves in and out between generic crime, politics, political crime, and the intersection between all of those things. Nichts, bitte. Bitte. Er ist dein bester Freund. Er ist wie ein Bruder. Er ist Familie. Nein. Er ist ein Judas. And during this process, he's trying to figure out who murdered an important political figure at the end of the second season. And he strongly suspects the Nazis are involved. And guess what? They are involved. But he's unable really to pin the villainy on the Nazis. And I think that does a great job here of not showing a boring traditional hero story here. He's, he's trying to bring down these evil people in a society, and we know he's going to fail. We know ultimately that the Nazis are going to take over, and we know that this is ultimately going to be a story in many ways of failure. No matter what he does, we know historically the Nazis are going to take control. So I really enjoy that element of sadness that is sort of all-pervasive in everything they do, of kind of 
the it's Chinatown attitude of the, the you know it's the the futility of taking action here. We're watching someone with the knowledge that everything they do will ultimately come to naught because you know he can't defeat history. But it's interesting to see him struggle through it. For instance, in the first two seasons, as he's trying to thwart the horrendous actions of the monarchists that are trying to bring back the Kaiser, we're kind of watching this and thinking, wait a minute, I know that these German right-wing militarists who want to bring back the Kaiser are bad, but if he had allowed them to bring back the Kaiser in the 1920s, then that means that Hitler would never have come to power. So in many ways, Geryon, even though he doesn't know it, is actually doing something wrong. Because if the, the monarchists came to power, you know, we wouldn't have had the type of Second World War that we would have. We probably still would have had a Second World War even without the Nazis, because the German militarists were interested in bringing that out, even if they weren't the non-Nazi German right were willing to bring that about. But still, it's, it's fascinating to see that, because you're kind of thinking, I hate these monarchists because they're trying to bring poison gas into the country and maybe threatening to use dangerous poisonous gases from the First World War, like phosgene, to kill perhaps tens or hundreds of thousands of people in Berlin during the first and second seasons. But on the other hand, you know, there's no way that these guys would have been as bad as Hitler. But... So it, it may have been for the best that they took control, or if the communists, these sort of violent terrorists, had taken control, even during Stalinist times, wouldn't that ultimately have been better than Hitler? Even still would have been pretty horrifying. During the third season especially, we get a close-up look at the oft ill-understood and frequently misstated history of the non-Nazi German right and their collaboration with the Nazis. Die NSDAP muss aus dem Visier der Öffentlichkeit kommen. Solange Sie diesen Teil unserer Abmachung nicht erfüllen, werden wir auch nicht wieder zuschlagen. Weder bei der Lügenpresse noch sonst irgendwo. Hand wird nur von Hand gewaschen. Schönen Tag, August. Because a lot of people tend to believe that the Nazis seized power in 1933 when Hitler became chancellor, but that's an oversimplification of what happened. Because six months before Hitler seized power, in the summer of 1932, the, the, the Weimar Republic effectively came to an end when the conservative government that was running Germany at the time effectively put forward a coup and began working behind the scenes in order to exert control through mandate by using or misusing a part of the German constitution in order to rule by decree. And then they later, in the words of Ian Kershaw, a biographer of Hitler, levered the Nazis into power. It's actually a Nazi myth to say that they seized power. It's much more accurate to say that they were pushed into power by the non-Nazi German right who thought that they could control the Nazis. And and of course, they couldn't. But it shows that interesting interplay between the Nazi right and the non-Nazi right, and how they each thought that they could use the other. But that was a very dangerous game, as we know historically, because the non-Nazi German right was eventually pushed aside and used by the people that they were trying to dominate, the Nazis, the more extreme right-wingers. Amidst all of this, I haven't spoken much about the second main character, Charlotte Ritter, Ich will zum Mord. Du willst zum Mord. Hier gibt's keine Frauen. And she is a fascinating character. In some ways, a film noir sort of staple, kind of like Boston Blackie, this spunky police detective woman or a police detective assistant who helps out the main character, but she's a full character in her own right, and we get to see her life and her struggles coming out of a life of a prostitute, leaving the terrible home life she had with this abusive stepbrother that she had who married her sister, and trying to save her own sister from following the same path that she took, her 13 or 14 year old sister who was also uh, maybe becoming a prostitute in order to survive. In the and I really like seeing her working class struggles contrasted with Garion's more middle-class concerns. Garion is going through his own problems because he's a veteran of the First World War, is trying to kick his morphine habit, but he's always going back to it because of the, the, the terrors of his job and the psychological damage of the First World War. So I think he kind of represents symbolically all of Germany, 
that is psychologically damaged by the cruelty and the, the dehumanization of the war and this need to sort of escape into a dream. There are also a host of other fascinating characters, and because this is historical fiction, they sometimes weave in real people. Like, for instance, uh, the Reich President, not the Reich President, the Chancellor, Gustav Stressmann, I think the Chancellor, and uh, the Reich President, uh, the, the First World War General Hindenburg. Karl, we stehen die Aktien. Herr Reichspräsident. Ende. Hat zum Hose. Excellent. Ja, dann wollen wir wohl ein bisschen preußischen Urgeist in diese Angelegenheit fließen lassen. Wir sagen gesunden Menschenverstand. That's just brilliantly mixed in with this, you know, for a history junkie like myself, this show is like heroin, you know. Anyway, this video is also really long as it is, but suffice it to say, this is a brilliantly done, beautifully crafted, well acted television drama that will appeal to anyone that has an interest in the Weimar Republic, the 1920s or 30s, politics, history, anything to do with that era of German history. You're always going to be just excited trying to figure out what you remember from real life is going on here on the screen that in this fictionalized form. And it is one of the best examples of modern film war that I've ever seen. And I can't wait for there to be a fourth season. I was fascinated by what was going on here in this third season because right at the end, the stock market crash occurs in late 1929. So you know that's going to ramp up the terror and the violence and the, the political struggles that are going on and the real struggle for control of Weimar Germany with Gary and Rath, Charlotte Ritter, and a few other people that he's, he's worked with along the way, including a, a journalist, that are interested in fighting for the Republic and for democracy. And on the other side, the monarchists, the communists, and the Nazis, who all hate and struggle with one another, but are united in their desire to bring down the Weimar democracy. Crucially, the Nazis were never really able to get a true majority in most of the election cycles they won, but they were able to be the largest minority, and they were not the minority among Germans that did not trust or hold to the legitimacy of the Republic. So I think that's fascinating that nowadays these people that were despised back then in German society and generally hated by quite a few Germans that were supporting the Republic are now being shown as heroes how evil these anti-democratic people really were for Germany and then later the world. I'm going to close by mentioning that Karl Marx in the 1800s when talking about Emperor Napoleon III said that history repeats itself first as tragedy then as comedy. Well, I think that nowadays we're actually seeing the repetition of history with political extremes along the left and right as the comedy phase of that history repeating itself. And this show in the 1920s and 30s is going to be the tragedy phase, where we get to see a dim reflection of some of the extremists that we know nowadays in society, but when they were much more violent and much more dangerous and had much more of a severe effect on the world that they lived in. And it even closes nowadays, we're looking at another, you know, we had just uh, 12 years ago a severe stock market crash, and we might be going through another one right now. But there are so many things going on it that are like, you can look outside and see this is going on right now. There there are terrible things happening in the world, and they're related in some ways to what's going on back in 1929 Germany, with political extremes and divisiveness and people not trusting democracy and thinking that we live in sort of a, a morass and people turning to uh, ideologues in order to solve things. Everything about this show is incredible, and I'm eagerly looking forward to a fourth season. So anyway, my name is Michael. I've rambled long enough. Please tell me if you've seen the show and what you think about it and what you think about the politics that it portrays there, how you see the show, if you're interested in it, if you're interested in film noir or 1920s expressionist cinema or M from Fritz Lang and what you think of all that. Just tell me anything about this show. So anyway, my name is Michael. Please like this video if you liked it, and please subscribe if you want to see more videos by me about movies, video games, and Netflix TV shows that I'm interested in. And uh, thank you very much, and have a good night. Hail the dead.